we'll um a few more people joining us so we'll, um, i might i might get started eh? all right so um thanks everybody for joining us um what what we're going to cover today is really um today i didn't want to i didn't want to um the presentation be, to be too lengthy obviously but what we're trying to do with this presentation is um, give everyone a, just a, a, a brief overview of um, a lot of the updates to the new standards um, and really just see the differences uh, between the 2010 uh, and 12 amendments to the 20, 2021 um, uh, new standard uh, for internal waterproofing. Um, so briefly, uh, the presenters we've got in um, today um, have been involved with the, with the composition of the standards as well. Um, I might just give, um, if you guys just want to give us a 30 second um, sort of intro, uh, maybe maybe we'll, we'll just start from the top, Warren. You want to just give us a bit of an intro? Okay, hi everyone. Yeah, my name is, and um, thanks for the opportunity, Daniel and, and Ron um, and Dan Ray. So, yeah, my experience in the industry, uh, been in the construction industry for over 20 years. Um, initially, as a, well, I've done a lot of things, but initially, predominantly as a wall and floor tile, I got into waterproofing um, in that way. So, my area of expertise would be more in uh, under tile membrane systems. But over the last several years, I uh, got into the educational system from the certificate three level, so the vet sector, um, so teaching at trade school. Certificate three in construction, waterproofing, and then the last several years with master builders of Victoria and South Australia and developing resources um, for waterproofing. So it wasn't and really until I got into teaching that I realised how much I didn't know about waterproofing and how big the waterproofing industry is. So been lucky enough to teach a whole range of different cohorts, um, right from engineers to architects to subcontractors and yeah, really here as a support role. Um, and yeah, I love to answer any questions that I can and, and fill in where I can fill in. So appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, Byron. Dave, quick intro. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks for thanks for getting me involved. More than happy to support anything that promotes, you know, awareness around raising standards in in waterproofing. So I've been in waterproofing pretty much my whole uh, working life, which is up to about fifteen years now. I'm currently the managing director of Waterproofing Integrity. We specialize in uh, compliance consulting and also quality control, independent inspections during the construction process. Um, I'm involved in, in several committees, the most relevant of which is uh, BD038 for Standards Australia, which just um, released our new revision of AS3740. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. And Ron, you there? Quick intro? No, maybe not. That's all right. Uh, I'll do the info. for. Uh, so Ron's my old man. So he started... Are you there? No? Um, so yeah, he uh, Ron, Ron started Dan Ray and um, uh, he uh, started the company, founded Dan Ray Group, uh, has been over 40 years of industry experience um, in the contracting and building game uh, and waterproofing. And um, and myself, I am current, the current CEO so of uh, Dan Ray. So uh, the old man's pulling back a little bit, you know, he's giving me the reins. So, uh, so yeah, we're, we're, my role is basically the growth of the business, um, sales, strategy, and development. Um, so that's a wrap of the, of the presenters. So we'll, we'll have some quick, quick bit of question time at the end uh, if anyone wants to sort of pick our brains and um, ask us some questions. So we'll cover off um, a, a few things today. Obviously, the, the terminology in uh, the standard and the incorporation to the construction code. Um, and the, the, the update, the main updates in, in AS3740. And um, during that, we'll, we'll cover some of the, the defects and things that the, the standard is trying to then tackle as well. And we'll do a quick Q&A at the end. All right, so uh, incorporation of AS3740. So that there's um, basically four main areas uh, in the NCC. Uh, that, that cover off um, waterproofing specifically um, and uh, in the waterproofing areas, of, uh, wet areas in buildings uh, in F1.7, in volume one. 
And there's also a table in there that actually describes, uh, it determines when a, an actual building element is required to be waterproof. Um, and also then while the it references AS3740 in the NCC on actually how to make that building element waterproof uh, and water resistant. So I don't know if you want to add anything there, Dave, um, with regards to the NCC and AS3740. Yeah, I would just, just add one, one small thing is that, yes, AS3740 is um, adopted by the NCC as the deemed to satisfy provision. And that's, I guess, part of the why the revision was, was necessary because things have sort of changed in the industry. And as a deemed to satisfy standard, um, the industry was calling out for just more information, like show us, you know, different bath details, show us what we actually need to be doing, because that's what a deemed to satisfy document is supposed to be doing. And yeah, I think that's been, been achieved to some extent. We will add it's the, the deemed to satisfy is the minimum requirements. Okay, so a lot of people take the information as gospel. Um, and we are very much in in a little bit of a trial and error, and error phase with all of the technological advances that we've had. You know, so the NCC allows is a performance based code that allows for innovation. So through that process, we are going to see a bit of a trial and error. And uh, you know, unfortunately, we're in a space where we're seeing more errors than uh, than we would like. So the flexibility is great but the awareness is what we need in terms of training and understanding. 100%. Um, so a couple of uh, terms that have, um, we, from, from a contractor point of view uh, in DMRA doing remedial work, um, we've seen uh, these sort of main terminology misinterpreted in the industry um, and, and sometimes misused. So um, with regards to certain materials being used in building, <clears throat> so um, waterproof obviously meaning that it, it, it doesn't allow moisture to actually penetrate the material. And that often gets confused with water resistance. Um, and water resistance can actually allow moisture into that material. Um, but according to the standard, doesn't um, degrade under conditions of moisture. So, um, for example, concrete is classed as water resistant. Um, but not necessarily waterproof. Um, so they're, they're the sort of things we've seen in the building game um, where waterproofing is either not done or foregone because of its water resistance um, to terminology used there. So um, we found that, that, that that's a couple of issues in the game, in the building industry. Also, um, with the incorporation of terminology such as may, shall and should, in the, in the standards and in, and in the NCC. Um, may, the word may, when it's used, it give, is, is, is sort of op options. It, it, options are provided in using that statement. Um, shall is, it's mandatory to, to, to take out whatever's stated in the standard. And then should is a recommendation. So we see those that terminology is often um, mixed and matched as far as interpretation goes. But in when we look at remediation and, and uh, new, new build, it's really important to, to take that on board of what is actually mandatory and what's a recommendation uh, in the standard. I don't know if you guys want to add anything there as well. With, with can I just, can you hear me, Daniel? Yeah, yeah sure. <laughs> just, just with uh, Dave and with um, a question with the standard, Two, two words that have sort of come around in my space, normative and informative. <laughs> yes. Dave, do you, want to, do, you want to, do you want to expand around the standard since you've just been through the whole process and yeah, sure. rigours of the standard? A lot of people don't understand or interpret those two words that are in the standard. Can you just give us some, from the standards committee side of things, what normative and informative mean in the standard terms? Yeah, so that's actually very relevant and, and tied to what Daniel was just talking about there with may, shall, and should. Um, essentially, your normative is uh, text or sections of the standard which are telling you what must be done to comply with this standard, um, and, and therefore the deemed to satisfy component of the NCC. Uh, and informative is really more like uh, suggestions and recommendations. It, it can be anything. It can be 
uh, proposing like a, an installation method or something that you could consider, something that's maybe a little bit more abstract than saying, you know, your membrane must be installed correctly. That's, that's a normative section. Um, and most often your normative uh, makes up the first uh, core section of the standard. And then the informative um, is towards the end. So all your appendixes and, and that sort of thing. But there can be informative information during the main part of the standard, and that's normally mentioned as a note. So anything that's a note is is an informative element. Does that make sense? Yeah, great. Thank you. Nice one. Okay, so we'll jump into some updates. So just a quick overview of the general content um, of the of AS three seven four zero twenty twenty one. So the scope, the scope um, generally, um, there's an expanded list of terminology um, as when you look at the older waterproofing standard, generally the, the, the new standard covers a lot more now, it's a lot more in the scope and, um, and, and sort of terminology related to materials and the installation of membranes. The design also has, has been section, has been pulled out as in its own section. Um, so then uh, it sort of covers more uh, principles now relating to like showers, falls and floor finishes. So, so that, that component's now more concentrated on. There's a lot more elements in the design area. And in materials, there's also now in, in the appendix of, in the back of the uh, standards, um, it does show a compatibility chain. So that's a good reference point in um, showing you the compatibility from the substrate to the finish. So, um, in, in, in especially from a contract, from our point of view, it's great to see um, using a single supplier, single warranty across the, across them as well. So uh, that's a good a good reference point there. And insulation has also expanded to improve on um, things like you know higher color detail, two two D three D drawings to show certain details and um, certain contents such as vinyl, polish, concrete and floor heating have also been added into the installation um, component of the standard. Uh, the appendices also include some good reference documents too, such as um, a, a testing and checklist, a checklist uh, for compatibility um, and inspection, which, which is really, really good, good reference point as well. So specifically within the scope, um, the standards reference, there's some more inclusions of uh, references to other standards, such as uh, glass in buildings, floor coverings, and plumbing and drainage. And uh, what you'll also notice is that the, it's brought in the, um, the definition across all, uh, all building classes. So any building class in, that has a wet area, that's included in the scope of the of the standard as well, rather than before it only focuses focused on classes one to four uh, at that mentioned in, in the in the standard. Uh, and also the particle flooring has not been mentioned. Um, I don't know if you want to mention more about that too, Dave, Dave or, or Byron, about the, the taking out of the particle board um, out of the standard. I could probably give just a little bit of insight into, into why that was done. Really, it just uh, it didn't uh, match up with the requirement for having water resistant substrates. Um, you know, I know there is treated particle board flooring, but in the, um, the combined opinion of the committee um, and the, the failures they'd seen associated with it, they just deemed that it was, it was better to exclude it and say that it wasn't acceptable based on it not being a sufficiently water resistant and stable substrate. I say hallelujah, because <laughs> yeah. we saw a lot of manufacturers would allow subcontractors to install membranes on top of it, but not necessarily provide a warranty. Yeah. So where does the overlap lie? From the deemed to satisfy or the manufacturer's specs? 3740 being a reference standard under the hierarchical chain, that would take precedence. But then if it goes to court, like we see a lot of things are happening now in early discussions with David, obviously, where do we fall over? A lot of people aren't aware of the mistakes that they're making. And, you know, the only one who wins when it goes to court is the lawyers. So I think it's a very big uh, exclusion and it's a great one. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah the majority of your problems were with particle flooring anyway. Most of your bathroom failures and issues were related directly to particle boards most of the time anyway. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, terminologies that have been added in, um, which is I, I, I think is a great thing that they've added in sort of terminology that references dry film thickness. Uh, very, um, I, I feel it was commonly misinterpreted with um, wet film as well. Um, uh, you, one of you guys want to just briefly explain that what the wet film versus dry film just for the just for the sake of the audience. Yeah, well, <clears throat> the wet film wet film is tested basically during the application of a liquid membrane. It should be anywhere commonly. Um, and it's basically a comb that's got the, the microns on it, and you just basically the contractor dips it every so many square, every, so many times per square meter, depends on the products. And the manufacturer will give you a, a wet film thickness on that particular product. Uh, very important for liquid membranes. Not as you don't use it for, naturally for sheets, but it's very important for liquid membranes to obtain your wet film thickness. But you can go after the after mat and basically using an ultrasonic tester, you can do the either using a, a physical test where, where, where you cut a section of the membrane, which is not very recommended, uh, or use a, a dry film a thickness gauge or the ultrasonic gauge, and that'll give you uh, a, a thickness of overall of the membrane, which would be, um, again, recommended by the, by the manufacturer. Now, be very careful with the uh, application of membranes when they say two coats, you know, primary two coats, look at the wet film or especially the dry film because depending on the solids and depending on the, the type of material, it'll have different uh, basically curing thicknesses and yeah, it could be way out. If there's a problem, all the supplier does is check it and if it doesn't comply, you've just lost your warranty on, on the whole job. So that's very important. And a lot of contractors don't unfortunately do it. So it's very important. Um, I think the uh, also with the other the other so the competent person I think is definitely a, a good thing. Um, so I think they've they've brought that in. Um, Dave, you might be able to add to that too. The competency about obviously bringing in and focusing a lot more on licensing and um, yeah. Well, there's a lot of um, unfortunately there's a lot of contractors don't even know the that standards exist <laughs> and uh, well, and they just do their own thing and that, that's what they've been doing for years. Um, and like I mentioned earlier, the dry film, uh, so wet, wet film especially, a lot of them don't know what the comb is. Well, we call it comb in our, in our industry. Yeah. But a lot of them don't have it. Okay. And uh, it's very vital that you, you know, you check it as you go along. At least it gives you, uh, you're halfway, you know, sort of it gives you a, a rough indication of what, what you're doing uh, and that you're, you're applying the product according to the suppliers, you know, and, uh, and that's the problem. A lot of them don't, know, don't carry one, don't know they exist, nothing. And it's very de depressing actually. <laughs> so when the likes of us going out there checking jobs, like, you know, David and I do it, I'm sure, and Byron does too, peer reviewing and checking things, it's amazing what you find uh, during the course of it. So a competent person is someone that understands it completely, what, what, what he's actually doing. Yeah, yeah I, I think that's important. And, and the, the, the way that competent person is positioned is a little bit more of a qualitative statement, which, you know, I, I guess some people might say, no, no, I need to know that this person has this certification and this and this, and then they're a competent person. Well, it's not exactly that simple because there are, you know, wide range of different types of uh, waterproofing system installations. So it's, it's qualitative and needs to be assessed based on whatever the, the installation, whether it's new construction, remedial types of waterproofing systems. It's important that, that we're aware that the person needs to be competent and the builder that's reviewing their potential subcontractor should be thinking, okay, how do I evaluate this person to verify that they're competent? I'm gonna ask for their licensing, project history, maybe some CPD from the products that are being supplied, uh, the suppliers of those products, that sort of thing. Maybe we can, uh, Frank's made a good comment, competent person only applies to people carrying out moisture tests, F2.2.2.1. Maybe Frank can bring Frank on to discuss that a little bit more. Go for it, Frank. Jump in, buddy. No, so if you, if you actually search for the terms competent person, it only comes up twice. Once, right. once in the definition and the second time in F2.2.1 under test methods. It says all tests should be carried out by a competent person. Unfortunately, I agree that competent person should apply to the application and everything else, but in the standard, it only applies to that one particular test method. That's to do with moisture testing in subfloors. Nice. 
Thanks. Thanks a lot, Frank. All right. Um, and efflorescence and fall have also been, but we, we've we've got some more slides on that um, um, on those and that like terminology as well. So, um, so this this slide here, so that they it, they talk about in the standard about um, uh, membrane states as well. I think this is a good one because um, the often in construction. Um, the membrane, as you can see on the right there, the membrane goes through th basically three stages. Um, and often uh, with liquid membranes, um, the membranes get to stage one or two, uh, sorry, stage two, and it's basically almost pretty much touch dry, but it hasn't fully cured. Um, and then we're already recoding and putting finishes on there and things like that. Um, um, so that, that's, a, that's a big problem in the industry. Uh, I know, Dave, Dave, you've probably got some comments on this one too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. I think you explained that, that very well. And that's why we you know, decided it was a good idea to put in those curing stages. Um, and because, for example, um, you might think it's dry, touch dry when you achieve, say, the overlay stage, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea to go in and do a flood test on that area. Um, there's a chance, depending on the product, that you're actually going to do damage to it by doing that. So what I would actually uh, encourage for all the uh, product suppliers, manufacturers out there is to actually start including these in because by only including one curing period, you're allowing that to be misinterpreted and say, okay, 24 hours at 25 degrees, that's it, flood test it now. Um, define those, otherwise you're going to be as accountable as anyone for when it's not treated correctly. Yep. Also, too, you've got to take into account the times of the year that you're actually installing the membranes. Um, you know, suppliers will say cured in uh, 24, you know, 48, 72 hours, right? But in, in some cases in winter, you might need a week to get even close to curing, okay, uh, depending on the product. And then you Yeah, well, we like, have – sorry, I mean, sorry, one. We have, you know, the, the standard testing parameter is 23 degrees at 50% RH being relative humidity, how many times we would achieve that temperature parameter on site on average per year would be, I, I don't even know how you would measure that. You'd have to actually do physical measurements, but that would change seasonally and annually. So it is a bit of an issue. You, would, you need to allow more time than what the technical data states state. It's as simple as that. I have a bit of a suggestion on that one that I, I can't recall which data sheet it was, but what I saw was they did like a, a matrix of, of curing periods that sort of gave, you know, a range, you know, your 10 degrees, 25 degrees and 35 degrees, something like that. And sort of just to demonstrate, you know, what the difference are and it would be up to the installing contractor to interpolate that and, and make judgments around when it's cured, but the more information, the better. So I, I'd love to see that too, if, if uh, we can get that on tech data sheets. Yeah, nice. Nice. Um, there's also additional uh, additional um, uh, points on on the lead control flanges. Uh, I've got a couple more slides on that too, where traditionally you had the membrane sort of just turning down straight into the drainage pipe and there's no lead control flange. Um, and also screening too. I've, I've got some more slides on the screeds as well, but um, basically, as you can see here, um, the, the standards allow for the membrane um, substrate to be either the screed or the concrete slab um, in the in the standard as well. So you can a waterproofing of top or below the, the screed on that as well. Oh that's that's it there. So yeah so the substrate can be actually the screed or or the um, concrete slab. Um, as you can see the water the so the riser and then the um, you've got the leak control flange. Um, and membrane, the stand is allowed for the membrane being turned down or, or, or uh, adjoining onto the leak control flange as well. Um, we've got um, some of the wet film. That's an example of one there uh, with the with the standard coving on the on the uh, wet film thickness gauge. Um, so that that that's term, that terminology uh, is in the um, in the new standard as well. They put that in there. Well, I'll talk a little bit about those wet film gauges. Since that uh, <laughs> yep. I helped design them, um, so what a lot of people aren't aware that depending on the class of membrane that's being installed, being a liquid membrane uh, in particular, a there's a, there was always a lack to 
get wet film thickness gauges, as Ron alluded to before. Um, so many installers aren't even aware that they need to monitor the wet film thickness. But the other, the other uh, issue that's out in the industry is cutting the fillet or the bond breaker in the corner to the same size as what's listed in 3740 as the recommended cove size for that class of membrane. So we see class two membrane, 35 mil cove, which is measured along the hypotenuse of the, uh, the fillet. So where it's indicated by that line. So the long side of the triangle or for a class three being um, more elastic or having a high movement accommodation factor in the membrane itself. So over 300%. A 12 mil cove, and that cove in the corner or the fillet is designed to help the liquid membrane transition from a vertical to horizontal surface. Even where we have external corners, we want to be chamfering the edges so that we help that membrane transition smoothly and evenly. It's a critical junction that needs a lot of attention and is a common failure point. So, detailing into waste outlets or our internal junctions are critical failure points in our wet areas. So pretty good tool. It does work. Um, and it's worthwhile, you know, having a look at it and giving it a trial because we need to improve as an industry. And, you know, the, the wet film gauge, it's not conclusive. Neither is the dry sonar device. But what they do is they help us to provide more assurity that we're monitoring what we're doing. So... From a manufacturer's standpoint with a liquid membrane, it would be also beneficial to ask what a tolerance range is. So how thick or how thin can the liquid membrane be used um, or be installed and still maintain warranty? And it can actually, yeah, good point you make, uh, Frank, it can actually be used for proprietary transitional tapes as well. So. We want to understand if our liquid membrane has got to go on at one mil dry film thickness after two or three coats, what is deemed too thin and what is deemed too thick to allow the membrane to operate its optimum performance capabilities? So just some things to note. Yeah, just thanks, very quick note, I just want to add on that. Um, my team does uh, hundreds of dry film thickness tests every day and we note uh, a huge difference between installing contractors that use these wet film gauges to test their thickness themselves and make sure they're on the right track um, compared to the ones uh, uh, that don't. It, it ends up with a much better result just doing that quick test yourself. So it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah, yeah, definitely see that, Dave. Um, often contractors then see, they look at it visually without actually, yeah, and they say, yeah, that looks thick enough, but yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like Byron said, it's not, it's not guaranteed, but at least it gives you a, a, a yeah. sort of you're on the right path of achieving something properly, you know. Um, so, yeah, so um, uh, moving on to design. So, um, so <clears throat> the standards um, categorise, it's basically categorise uh, the wet areas into three, three risk areas. Uh, high risk, obviously, uh, sort of being where most the most water resides in in a wet area so like things like showers baths um it, it basically within reach of any shower fin um and then all the way down to low risk where there's limited very limited uh exposure to water and those and these and these risk categories are then used um in the standard to then clarify what uh, types of, or design uh, principles need to be applied in those risk situations. Do you, you want to? Did you guys want to add more to that about, about the, the three categories? What, why, why they why they've been put into place? Um, I think you summarised that yeah. well. It's it's really just to outline the different risks and the different considerations that should be made in in each of those. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's when yeah, it's when waterproofing like your toilets or your yeah. laundries and things like that. It just gives you a better perspective of what you should be doing properly. Yep, yep. Um, I did. Um, I did. It's you know now been um, highlighted that in laundries for say, which would be a low risk category um, or sanitary compartments that we're only required to have a water resistant junction. But what we commonly see is. WR plasterboard getting used in these areas and plumbing fixture failure 
happens at a very high rate. So we get flooding into that area that no longer has a, a vertical upturn of a liquid membrane or shape membrane, depending on the system that you're choosing. And relying on a sealant junction to provide a water resistant joint to what area plasterboard, so WR board, it's just plaster with some blue paper on the top. Uh, I think how we actually need to minimise risk is excluding wet area plasterboard in these areas and classifying a wet area as a wet area and installing our fibrous cement sheet products, for example. So something that won't break down if it gets saturated. Can I just point out one thing as well? I know it doesn't say it in this slide here, but um, the category three areas, I believe in the standard, they say uh, no fall necessary or, or something. Uh, yes. Like yeah. Yes. So yes, you're right. I, I want to point out to, to everyone that that isn't relevant to, you know, your class two, three, four buildings. And, and, and why that is, is that in the NCC, which, you know, does override the standard, all of those buildings where you have a wet area above a habitable space require a floor waste to be installed in say the general bathroom area or the laundry area and then where a floor waste exists you must have a fall to it so you can't use you can't have flat areas in in that situation yeah yeah i think that's in a slide and that yeah so that's good clarity um dave because i think there is a slide where i've, I've put that in there Right. Um, but yeah, no, definitely. The, as far as um, uh, clarifying that, it's that's that's a good point. Um, so, the F uh, Daniel, Daniel, do the architects know that? <laughs> I'm just going to leave that. <laughs> that's, one. What that's what we're trying to do, Dave. <laughs> that's right. They, they don't want to know that is the answer. <laughs> and they don't want to take on the liability either. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, they that's don't right. want to know. They don't want to know anything about an 18F. Yeah. Either. Yeah, definitely. Um, so just just so this one just on falls. So so um, um, the, the the does mention the standard too about about um, ensuring a, a minimization or the or the the you know the design should consider minimizing causes of efflorescence. So efflorescence um, um, basically um, there's a few reasons why that occurs, and I've, I've just shown again that you know the the membrane being installed above and below the screen, but the, the efflorescence um, and, and the guys can chime in here too about the causes of efflorescence. There's a few causes and why that happens, uh, but ma mainly it's, it's, it's the salting that occurs uh, where water draws the salts out of the, out of the uh, uh, cement or the, or the, or the tile bed. Um, and Byron, you, you've got a good point too on the buttering and of the tiles and, and that and the, you know, that meeting standard as well. So if you wanted to talk about that or if you guys wanted to talk about some of the, you know, the issues with moisture underneath underneath and causing uh, efflorescence as well. Yeah, well, we, so a lot aren't aware that the actual issues or a lot of the issues, so the standard doesn't account for overflows. So what it accounts for is subtile moisture entrapment in this particular area. So or subsurface moisture entrapment. So where we would have our tiles being installed. Okay, so there's a couple of reasons why efflorescence occurs and there's, you know, I'd love a few others on here to chime in as well, because I don't know them all. Um, but commonly we see it's from a, a lack of fall, so inadequate falls. So um, particularly in externally where we're one in a hundred is definitely not enough fall for an external exposed area. How the tiles are installed. So many tile, as we see in the industry, don't use the appropriate method for adhering the tiles. So inadequate notch trail sizes, leaving large voids under the tile. Spot fixing can enhance efflorescence. So we have large pockets of water. Um, we get hot, cold cycle. The water's trying to evaporate. The use of cement-based tile adhesives has also enhanced the onset of efflorescence. And where we're having a screed exposed to constant saturation, so membrane subscreed, for example, not enough fall on the surface to get the water off the surface fast enough into the outlet. All of this periodic saturation and drying out will enhance the onset of efflorescence in short. I mean, we could talk about efflorescence for half an hour um, because there is a whole multitude of reasons why it can happen. 
And it's also been uh, put down to a, a diminishing quality of our building products, in particular sand. And um, so, or sand contamination in screeds um, is another large reason why we see it as well. So our sand will get brought onto the job site. It's left to get contaminated with uh, a building debris. Plaster dust is a big one, and that can bring on the onset of efflorescence. So I know Frank as well is a tiling consultant and waterproofing consultant. Do you have anything to add to that, Frank? Oh, look, realistically, you know, minimise the exposure of anything cementitious to water and make sure water drains away. If you have water sitting somewhere, or you're going to get efflorescence and, you know, get your tile adhesive coverage under, underneath the tiles to close to 100% as you possibly can and you, 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 the issue pretty much goes away. Yeah, so Paul's, we're seeing a leaching residual, not salts coming up through grout lines. Any ideas why? It's probably going to be calcium hydroxide from the cement component. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys see more of the use of um, salt retardants used now in, the, in, in screeds and try, to try and mitigate that risk as well? Just stick the membrane on top of it, mate. Yeah. <laughs> it's as yeah. simple as that. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, at Dan Ray, we, we push a lot the membrane on top to try and encase the uh, screed um, and, um, yeah, and just watch what grout you use, try and minimise it. Obviously, that all relies on whoever does a screed doing a reasonable job, right? That's a that's another big factor. Sometimes the screeds are more sand than cement. So, um, yeah. Now, day, on the right? other hand, I, I saw some screeds on the job yesterday that were better than the concrete. Yeah. So, so you can actually do it properly it can be done yeah. so one thing you know it was when i was working at trade school the brickies always measured their their mortar mixture to the milk their cement sand lime ratio to water was always clearly measured we don't typically see that with screeding sand and cement um you know i was taught by the old europeans so i got pretty good at screeding but Still, we never really measured it to, to the mill. Um, so in a high-risk zone, we may have to look at using a proprietary screed, which is a manufactured or engineered screed, um, and additives from the manufacturer to help, you know, prevent the onset of efflorescence coming in. Um, under resilient flooring, we need to have an MPA rating of 20 most standard cement traditional That's changed, screed. actually. It's changed? Yeah, it now says you must use a proprietary screed. Correct. So, yeah, that, so, that's it does, so, so the, the MPA is, is no longer in that standard. So, the yeah, that was the point I was going to make. We're yep. not usually going to achieve that rating from a standard cement or a non-proprietary screed. So, you know, we will, which does heighten the expense, but probably guarantees uh, a little more quality. Yep. Yeah, nice. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, the um, so yeah, this is the this is the slide that Dave, David was talking about. Um, so with the with the low risk uh, and no falls being retained in yet, you know, shall be retained in the area. So that 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 does refer. You've got to be careful of you know referring that, especially with the um, being you know uh, wet areas over habitable spaces, like you were saying. Um, did you want to add, add any more there too, David, about, about yeah, that? That's, yeah. That's pretty much it. You're just yeah, it cool. up perfectly. Yeah. But, um, yeah, just it, it, it can be misleading. We've got to remember that that, that NCC clause in, in that situation will yeah. override this, So just so no one gets caught out with it. Yeah. It does talk about having a localised falls yeah. to, at, at doorways to direct the water back in if there's any surface water. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Uh, materials. So, so there's some additions in the material section of the standard um, with regards to glass, PVC, and um, structural plywood, uh, and then our concrete as water-resistant service material as well. Um, and as we mentioned before, the removal of that that flooring grade particle board um, uh, that that's been taken out completely out of the material section of the standard. Uh, going into installation, the um, 
um, membrane or yeah, installed above or below the tiling screen, obviously preferably above. And the leak, the leak control flange uh, must be recessed. So um, did you guys also have any comments about that too, being recessed into the substrate? Because I know we've had, a, we've had a, a few questions about that with regards to recess being the substrate, being the tile bed or the concrete slab on that as well. Well, you tend to you tend to see them sitting on top in concrete slabs. They don't normally yep. get them recessed in. Yep. yep. It's too, you know, it goes into the too difficult sort of uh, thing, but it needs to be looked at now, okay? Now, if you do it on top of the screed, then you can embed it in the screed, but you've got to make sure that um, all the terminations are correct. What do you think about that, Dave? Any, any other? Uh, so not really just that it is yep. what it says. The substrate yep. can be either your reinforced concrete or it can the substrate can be your... Um, your, your screed. So the actual definition for substrate, I know it was up before, was yep. um, the surface to which your membrane is applied. So the, the whole purpose of that is it gives you flexibility to do under or over the screed, but your you know leak control flange still has to meet that requirement. Yeah, gotcha. Can I just add something to that highlighted word there on top? Yeah. It says or, right? Yeah. So it actually means that if you do above and below screed, you're actually in contravention of the standard. So it's one or the other. And it's pretty important for people to get their head around, I think. And uh, Frank, would you like to, because there is there is issues with doing both too, um, right? Because it, it, um, there, there's that issue of locking the moisture into the, into the screed. That, that, that's what... Well, well, there is that, and and look, realistically, is what I always say is, why do you want to do both? You know, if you think you need to do one underneath because you're worried about the top one being, you know, being no good, well, then you haven't done the top one right. Yeah. Right. So do one, do that properly, and, and right. And if you want to add more membrane, well, add another coat to the top one. That that's actually way more effective than doing two separate layers. Because what happens if you have two layers of membrane, then your drainage is affected. Yeah. 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 Could I just add a little bit more on top of that? I completely agree with uh, what, what Frank just said there. And I, I think the origin of doing the, the under and over um, was uh, well-intentioned, um, but just not well thought out. So thinking that two layers of membrane, that's twice the performance, right? But the problem is it can, you know, create backfires and, and you know unforeseen consequences and i have a little bit of a speculation no offense to the product suppliers out there that it may have originated with you know special warranties being offered for above and below um, because of course you know twice the product is going to be sold so it's it's a good deal and you know the warranty makes it appear like a system that's going to perform better but there's just other factors that need to be considered to make sure it you know, actually works and also it's it's not going to comply with the dts strictly either well, I think it also comes into play because we see so many failures. Okay, so people use it as a substrate protection measure. Yeah. And, you know, so there's various different ways that you can do it. Um, and it really is a site specific consideration from site to site. Yeah, I think also, too, a lot of it generated originally, like due to effervescence, not that we got a lot inside, but they used to put an epoxy sort of membrane over the top of the screen to try and control that. From that, it ended up being a membrane. And then there's a combination of like Byron said in that warranties and more. But if you do a good job either, you don't need two membranes. You do it properly, either top or bottom. Preferably, like I said before, we prefer on top because you encase the whole substrate. Yeah. yeah. I agree 100 percent If you do yeah. your membrane coat on top of the on top of the screed correctly, even to the minimum requirements of AS 3740, you're not going to have an issue. But the reality is, unfortunately, we're not at that space yet. So that's probably our end goal. Troy's, uh, Troy's had a quick question on the, uh, is there consideration to microbial growth in a screen where the membrane is applied to the substrate? Uh, I believe there is if you get the moisture sitting in there. Well, gen generally, because it's a highly alkaline environment, it's not that easy for microbes to grow in there. Yeah. Um, so they actually, believe it or not, they like acidic uh, environments better than al alkaline ones. Yeah. 
So yes, it's it's possible, but it's because it's alkaline, it's reduced. But look, like everyone says, if you put the membrane on top of the screw, that grows away. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Nice. Um, so section uh, section four of the standard um, covers a lot of um, uh, testing. Uh, Dave, this will be a good one for you, I think. Um, so yeah, moisture content, inspection of membranes, and continuity testing. Yeah, no, this right up my alley. So um, essentially what the, the standards trying to provide, provide here is just a, a range of measures that can be used to you know, test the installation of the membrane. Prior to this standard, it was um, very skint on, on content. I think it was just sort of saying that a, a visual inspection mm -hmm. must have been conducted or, or something like that, which didn't really hold, you know, help anyone that's trying to, you know, do the installation correctly, but then also confirm it because the confirmation that, you, that it's been done correctly is as important as uh, the installation. It's, it's part of it. Um, and that's what this section is, is designed to show is different methods that, that are acceptable, um, deemed to be acceptable um, to meet that, uh, that requirement for some sort of close out inspection. Nice. And Dave, would you, um, would you have any, is it particular methods that, um, would be sort of you'd recommend in certain situations that may or may not be better in certain you know sheet membranes liquids things like that yeah that definitely is so the sheet membrane is probably a good example sheet membranes all come at a prefabricated thickness right there's no point doing any sort of thickness testing on those um because it's going to be defined so your thickness testing won't be needed there but instead, you are going to want to use a, a physical seam probe to provide more scrutiny to those overlaps, um, which necessar isn't necessarily something you would be doing on a, on a liquid monolithic membrane. Um, another important one, uh, continuity testing, whether that's via a flood chest or electronic leak detection, the main purpose of your membrane is to be a continuous barrier, right? So that's, that's important no matter where you install. Um, two more, I guess, unique ones, moisture content. And uh, I don't think adhesion test made it in there, but I'll use it as an example anyway, is probably going to be more important for exposed membranes. Maybe that's going to get a bit of traffic or that sort of thing, where the performance of that membrane is so closely tied to how well it's bonded to the substrate. So there definitely are some tests in there that are, are relevant to you know most membrane installations. And then there might be some other ones that, are, that you want to focus specifically on, on certain types. So that's a whole other discussion in, in itself, though. Yeah, no, awesome. Awesome. Um, in the, um, the other, the other one, one other specific area that's been mentioned or brought into this to the standard is polished concrete. Um, so they, there's specific things that are mentioned in there about uh, the membrane uh, being protected from abrasive damage, um, especially on the on the floor wall junction, and you need a you 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 specifically need a, a film separation layer on the vertical surface and walls to protect it from polishing. So, um, as you can see there in the, in the diagram, they mentioned that in here uh, with the with the polyethylene film separation layer. Uh, any other comments on on polished flooring or? or um... <laughs> Uh, some of the performance solutions I've seen get uh, allowed for polished concrete are very surprising. And if I was the building surveyor who signed off on it, I would probably be very concerned moving forward. Um, a lack of understanding of the products and the process that's required, the vertical separation at the shower perimeter being one, so a water stop angle, you, got, you can make it work, and it is a great-looking um, overlaid finish in a wet area, but it does need a clear understanding of design and the products that are used in order to make it work, and then obviously couple that with a suitable uh, cohort of subcontractors, being the waterproof installer, the concrete installer substrate fall is the key. Okay, underneath the concrete, not on top of it. So the standard itself doesn't cover sealers and decorative coatings as a list them as a waterproof membrane. So concrete will crack. It will allow moisture to transfer through. So we still need to direct that to the waste outlet where where required. Yeah. I uh 
just echo Byron's sentiments about, and, and before this provision was added in, it didn't exist before, um, yeah, there likely were um, some performance solutions getting away that didn't have a very good chance of actually performing. And that's why it's important to have this because your DIM to satisfy then becomes your minimum standard and any certifier that's reviewing a, a performance design um, we'll compare it to this and say, well, you don't even have a membrane in there at all. Therefore, you know, no go. And, and the second thing I want to add, because I, I don't think we've covered it in depth just yet, and it's quite a big change, is that in addition to having the one to 100 minimum fall on your finished floor level, you must also have one to 100 fall on the substrate to which your membrane uh, is, is applied. So that actually makes, when you think about it, a, a, a significant change to how structures need to be built. And I'm thinking, you know, multi-residential, that needs to be factored in now because if your drain point is two meters away from your door, that means that concrete slab needs to be poured with 20 mil fall um, over that distance, which is actually quite a difficult thing to do and may result in the need for increased slab thicknesses just to achieve this, this substrate pour. Yeah, yeah, good point, very good point. Um, so we, um, so they, they, we've, we've, um, that was sort of the major, major points. And I thought I'd, I'd spend a bit more time on uh, any questions that people might have um, out in the audience um, for any of the team uh, to, yeah, to cover off. Just uh, chime in, just unmute yourself and um, chime in. Just, just quickly, we <clears throat> we put the Australian Institute of Waterproofing logo on the on the bottom of this. Um, that's an institution pretty close to Australia wide, and um, if um, you know, it's a good institution to sort of join. That if you want to find out more information or you've got queries, you can post it to the institute, and the institute will pass it on to the technical advisors. It could go through different states depending what state you're in was the regulations change from state to state. So that's a good body to sort of help and uh, get through some of the difficult issues sometimes that uh, come about on buildings and that. Become a member. Become a member, basically, yeah. And it could help you down the track. Save you thousands. Yeah. Any other, uh, any other questions out there? Um, we've had we've had some from um, from the audience uh, before, before the seminar. Um, uh, just regarding, let's see. Uh, do, I mean, there's there's one, one questions around the pros and cons and differences between sheet, torchon, and liquids. Do you any 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 of you guys want to want to answer that one? Well, we're um, <clears throat> Dan Rose is a big big promoter of sheet membranes purely because they're manufactured to a certain thickness, and there's no error as far as you know wet film gauges and all this type of stuff. What you've got is what you get, basically what you're buying. Um, the only problem with that is a bit more costly and also um, you've got the installation methods like the, the the training and everything that not many contractors know how to do the sheet membranes. Um, liquids liquids are, are fine as well, provided that you, you, you apply, they're applied correctly. That's the big, the big problem. You've got more, more chance of issues with the liquids than you would have a possibly with a sheet membrane. And even sheet membranes, the, depending on what the situation, you've got a varying array of sheet membranes too, uh, all suited for, not all one product suits everything, okay? So you've got the option of different products for different situations. So that's, yeah. that's my take on it anyway. Like you just eliminate a lot of the uh, stuff up factors or the human factors out of it uh, a lot, you know, so. And for all the, oh, sorry, uh, Troy, were you going to say something? I was just going to ask whether there's an advantage with sheet membranes in that you can speed the program up. Um, I'm not sure if it was sick, but someone released a sheet membrane last year uh, that you could tile over, I think, 30 minutes after installation of the sheet membrane. So on, I guess on large scale boutique residential in particular, that that would be a useful system in that you know, you're not waiting 24 hours for a liquid to dry um, if you can tile on it immediately after installing it. Yeah. No, that's Put true. The with the, with uh, the sheet membranes, that, that's a big advantage, but you need to watch the um, the moisture content on it. If it's too high or whatever for the glues and all that to, uh, to be applied, just, to, just be wary of that. But once it is applied, whether it be use a, a secret product or there's an Artex product, whatever that 
you, you basically can lay your, your tile straight away once once it's completed. Yeah. It, just, just, just one thing I'd like to add to sheet membranes, and, and I agree, look, it's horses for courses, but one thing you have to have with sheet membranes is much, much better substrate preparation. Like a, a one millimetre grain of sand basically causes a 10 mil wide bubble uh, in a sheet membrane, whereas with a liquid, you can kind of dodge that bullet a little bit. So just make sure your surface prep is, is basically perfect when you're using sheets. Yeah. You do need skill skill set from the applicator is a big one, okay? Very common to see installers go in and do manufacturer's training for half a day to install sheet membranes and go, yep, no dramas, you're all good. Away you go. We, we might piggyback you for a job or two, and this is not all manufacturers, but I'm, there's, there's a few that adopt this methodology. One drama I've seen, particularly with under tile on lightweight balconies, and I, I'm a big fan of sheet membranes. I actually think that uh, the future is in sheets, but it is site specific, is where we're using adhesives over an epoxy primer, for example. That adhesive doesn't necessarily flash off correctly, even if you let it flash off. You really need to go back and do your post-membrane checking with your seed, seed probe tests, even a broom test. You've got to sweep it out to see if you actually have appropriate adhesion. So when we have substrates such as um, cellulose-infused boards or Skyon, for example, or resin-infused boards that require an epoxy primer over the top, if you're going to install a sheet membrane over it, you really need to do in-depth post-membrane testing before you tie up even if it is an, a tileable system. So um, both liquids and sheets have their advantages and disadvantages. If you've got multiple penetrations, then you're going to have an issue laying sheet membranes because of skill set issues from the subcontractor. So yeah. Yeah. you need to do your due yes. diligence. Membranes require a multi-stage inspection process, and the first one of that inspection process is a design review. Okay, that is the first stage of inspection, even before a tool's been touched. I think that's a great way of saying it, uh, Byron. Uh, the, the, the conversation about what's better, sheet or, uh, or liquid, isn't one that you can just answer in a generic sort of sense. It is the right product for the right situation. And there's, there's so many factors that, that contribute to it being the right or the wrong product. But I'll just share the one that I find the, the most important in, in my design review of it is the substrate stability. Um, if, say, reinforced concrete, quite a stable substrate, I would be confident putting a, a fully bonded liquid membrane on that because I think there's a low chance there's going to be movement that would result in that splitting. Um, another substrate, say, FC sheet or even lightweight concrete or, or anything that's just generally unstable and may have life cycle movement, sheet membrane all the way. Um, it will not split if there is movement like a bonded liquid membrane will. Um, and yeah, that's that's one takeaway I'd like to share with everyone on that discussion. Have you guys seen that, that more on the introduction, especially with the introduction and, and use of more of a sky on, like sky on boarding and yep. stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That. I do not see what I really, it is possible to do that with the liquid and you know put yep. reinforcing over the junctions. But really, I'm not nearly as comfortable with it as a, as a liquid. Yeah, there's a lot more. There's a lot more with, with Sky on. There's a lot more attention is required using the using a liquid. A lot more, and uh, you got to be very careful. Um, and another well, thing it, with it starts with how the it with how the builder puts it together. Actually, yeah, because half the, half the time that's where the problem starts. Yeah, even the laying of the two frames. Yeah, the laying that's my point. So, yeah. so, so just on sheet membranes though. Before we move on, sorry, Ron. Yeah. There's, there's some one thing that has changed in this version of the standard is and it and it's applicable to sheet membranes in particular. And that's section uh, clause 3.7. It says adhesives used in waterproofing systems shall be waterproof in accordance with ASN that is 4858, where waterproof to waterproof materials meet. So that means the laps of a sheet membrane have to be done with a material that complies with 4858. So at this stage, there's only one system that I think is on the market that actually meets that criteria. Yep. Awesome point, Frank. Really good. That's a that's a really good point, especially with um, compliance. 
uh, making sure the membranes, you can actually get that certificate, the 4858 uh, certificate on membranes. For the glue. No, no, this is for the glue in between the two. Oh, for the glue in between. Oh, yeah, so so, okay. where, so the adhesive used where waterproof to waterproof materials meet must meet 4858 as well. Gotcha. All right. So, if yeah. say for example, you were, I know there's sheet membranes on the market that are used that are glued down with a tile adhesive. You couldn't use that in the lap. You'd have to use a different material. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that's that's really good. Um, all right. I'll I'll um I'll maybe I'll maybe do one more one or two more if there's any if there's any more questions. I've got one more question. Um, if uh, you guys want to answer that, what what are some of the the major or, or common compliance issues that um, that you guys have seen out in the out in the marketplace with regards to waterproofing or, or AS three seven four zero in particular. Water stops are a big one. <laughs> That's a big one. Yeah. Water stops is massive. So incorrect installation of water stops being a big one. Uh, membrane film thickness. Well, it's not really. A thirty seven forty, but it's more manufacturer specs. But they go hand in hand. So, but water stops is a big one that I've seen. Detailing into waste outlets is a huge one. Really got to check all the penetrations, whether it be on the wall or floor surface. Yeah. Um, and the other big one that we see is the mixing of products. So system to system compatibility chain really does. Uh, need to be established and to touch on what the boys just mentioned before we see the highest level of percentage of failures of membranes from the installation perspective and it must be highlighted that it is not only from the installation of the membrane it's how the substrates have been installed mm -hmm. okay so where it's internal or external Membranes cannot be used to consolidate a substrate or fix up surface irregularities. Some of them may work in particular scenarios, but they rely on having a sound, well-prepared substrate. So the sky on Saga, and it is... Yeah, that's finished. Yeah, just about finished, yeah. It's a bloody huge issue, and I literally tried to work with Hardys for months last year because where we have a sump drain or a channel drain in our balcony, it is non-compliant. There's no warranty. No one has warranty for it. We only, uh, they only allow a removable edge gutter detail unless you get a site-specific specification. And the specification that was drawn up does not allow for sub tile moisture entrapment to escape freely into the waste, which will develop microbial growth and efflorescence. And that steaming under the surface or that moisture that's trapped under the surface heats up, turns into steam, particularly for liquid membranes, puts it under pressures that they're probably not designed to accommodate. Yeah. Um, could I just add just one more, uh, pretty pretty simple one really. Um, and, and there actually is nothing in the, in the standard about this so far as I remember and understand, um, but considering screed thicknesses um, if there's a chance that your screed will be an unbonded one so some type, certain types of membranes allow the screed to be bonded easily enough um, other types of membranes with a very slick oily surface may not allow that screed to be bonded and if that screed ends up being too thin especially around your drain points then it's going to become unstable and cause issues um, in the in the um, you know the life cycle of the the area um, yeah, so there's that one. And then just as a side note without explaining, because I know we're short on time, is that for external areas, anyone that's using tiles on pedestals to achieve a flush transition, it's a performance solution. Um, just because the current DTS standard for external doesn't cover it. Um, so just something everyone should be aware. I know there's just not enough awareness around that at the moment and certifiers are starting to ask for evidence about how that's compliant. So that's all. Just Dave, just on that, yep. that's a very, that's a very prominent detail that's coming up in expert reports and all that sort of stuff where you've got a straight transition from inside out. Um, so you're saying you need a deemed to satisfy solution for that, even though the Versi pave is virtually letting it drain down to the substrate and getting to the outlet anyway, which is 
virtually functioning as intended as, as if you've got a linear drain outside the sliding door. So why would you have a deemed to satisfy in that case? So, so that's exactly why it's a performance solution because you're using, you know, an alternative innovative new system. And that's why the NCC is written as a performance document. Um, the, you're essentially saying, okay, well, instead of using tiles on screen, which is the thing that's covered in, you know, the 2012 version of 465 4.2, um, we're using this tile and pedestal system and it's going to perform. So essentially what you've done just in that statement there was justifying it as a performance solution. Um, because the way the deemed to satisfy reads, it's your waterproofing upturn height, including at your doorway, must be, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 mil above the finished floor level. And that was based on a tile and screed system where most of your water is going to drain at the finished floor level. Okay. Thanks. You can get uh, channel drains on pedestals as well, which can help achieve compliance. Okay, that they can be a deemed to satisfy then if you have that channel drain in there as yeah. well. Yeah, but if it's a if it's directly butted up to that uh, the door threshold, due to you know we've got a waterproof to the one in a hundred year storm. Okay, that's you know the worst possible case scenario, and where we have high rainfall with high wind and the potential for hail, that those joints that allow the moisture to freely escape where there where there's no grout in between our tiles and the pedestals, they can become bridged, and then we have a water table that's sitting directly on top of the surface. So if we don't stop that, I heard another method is allowing a ten or fifteen mil. Uh, joint at the front of the threshold to allow that to get through. If it fails, you're done. Yeah. The reality is sometimes it doesn't fail and you'll get away with it. But if it fails, you're done. That's even 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 if you've got an under undercovered balcony, which is roughly ten to ten to 12, 12 square meters. You know, wind direction depending, whatever. So yeah. But the, anyway. thing the, the standard doesn't actually differentiate whether it's a fully exposed balcony or an undercover balcony. Yeah. Um, should it? Possibly, because it does make a huge difference. Um, Absolutely. But it, yeah, but it, it doesn't come doesn't to distinguish the letter of the law, then, you know, it's all the same. I just want to say it's great that you've put this together, guys. You know, so it's really good to get a whole range of different people here with different levels of experience to discuss these topics because it's how we're going to get it out quicker and it's how we're going to fix these multitude of issues we have. So congratulations to Dan Ray and everyone for jumping on. Now, well, on that note, I really appreciate that, Brian, and, and thanks to um, David um, Privet on, you know, for his input too and Byron. It's been really good. And um, Ron, obviously, too. And thanks for your, um, thanks for your comment. Oh. And I'm just getting nowhere. <laughs> um, I don't know. Yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks, everybody, for jumping on. You have a lot of um, synergy setting up. <laughs> uh, obviously. Um, just yeah. <laughs> just <laughs> it's un Someone's unmuted. Unmuted. Brad made a good point. We need overflow provisions on balconies as well. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Um, so right. no, obviously, thank you, uh, thank you so much to everybody uh, for jumping on. Uh, thanks a lot, Frank, too. For you, I know you, you made a lot of great comments uh, in the presentation, and um, yeah, just uh, stay tuned for uh, for sort of more info and getting the boys involved and the, and the industry involved. Really, really look to um, improve the industry for all of us. So awesome. thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks everyone, thanks, and uh, take thanks, care. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks a lot. No Thanks, Dave. Catch Byron. up, Dave. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.